I've made a lot of video clips in a relatively short time and as I view them I notice that the production qualities, the quality of sound and image isn't always as good as it could be. Isn't always as good as uh, things I see on YouTube by other people. And as I reflect on this, oh and by the way there was an episode earlier where I reflected on what I did and this will be kind of along the same lines. As I reflect on this I uh, see that I'm presenting ideas that I've read over the years, over the decades. In this clip I introduced the idea of the mindscape. The idea is that just as the landscape contains trees and rocks and when we encounter a rock it was already there, we just encounter it. The mindscape is the space of all ideas and so when we have an idea we're just encountering it in the mindscape, an idea that already existed. And most of the ideas I present are not mine. A few perhaps are original. In this episode I spoke about how to make a scripture. The idea may be orig original, I'm not sure. Doesn't mean it's all that great, but I think it might be original. I suppose that people have different sensitivities, different talents, different interests. And my interest has always been philosophy and uh, uh, religion, I guess you could say too. I I know that when I was in high school, I was the Latin dunce. On occasion, the teacher would call on people to get up and translate a passage, and whenever he called my name, everybody around me would snicker, because they knew it was going to be pretty bad. So I wasn't good at that, but I was good at abstract thought, mathematics, philosophy. And I think because of that, I had problems with uh, the religion I was taught very early, early on, in second grade, I believe. I wasn't in Catholic school yet, but I was given instruction uh, after class in the religion as preparation for First Holy Communion. And I remember the idea that non-Catholics went to hell seemed wrong to me. It just didn't seem right. And I, I, I just had a problem with that. And I remember in about sixth or I think seventh grade, we were taught by nuns. And once in a while, the priest would visit the room. And the priest came in and he said, oh, sister, what wonderful boys and girls. And how many of you boys or girls want to be priests and nuns when you grow up? And a lot of people raised their hand. I remember I didn't. And I thought, I'm going to do something, but not with you guys. When I was in high school, I had a religious teacher, a religion teacher, and I happened to have him for all four years. And uh, his nickname was Yahweh. Uh, Yahweh, of course, is the name of the Old Testament God, God the Father. And when he spoke about God, he kind of got a, a gleam in his eye. Maybe a little crazy. And that's why the students named him Yahweh. And I, I liked him. And I, my opinion of some other priests in the school was I, I couldn't see their vocation. I couldn't see why they were priests. Now, of course, that was just a superficial judgment. They might have had perfectly good reasons. But to me, some of them seemed to be priests like someone is a plumber or a cab driver. But this religion teacher seemed to have a real enthusiasm, a real interest in God. And I, I admired him for that. I also, when I was in high school, had a music teacher. And he was a Jehovah Witness. And I took lessons for four years. And maybe twice in those four years, somehow we got into a discussion about religion. I don't remember how. And I remember, I remember once we did that. And I could hear students piling up outside in the outer room waiting for their lesson. But he, once he got on religion, that was it. He didn't care. And eventually I was feeling kind of embarrassed. I didn't want to cut the conversation short. We were going back and forth. He was making points. I was points. But at the same time, I could hear the students in the outer room. And uh, But it was clear to me what this music teacher, what came first in his life. And I admired that in him too. And when you have a philosophical sensitivity, certain things impress you. And I th here's an argument I heard later in life that I had heard it early would have impressed me quite a lot. It, I believe it's Aristotle, I'm not sure. But the idea is, do you believe that every meaningful statement right now is either true or false? So now there could be non-meaningful statements, like something out of Alice in Wonderland or the frog is raining. But if the statement is meaningful, 
is it either true or false right now? And Aristotle, or whoever had this idea, said, well, if you believe that any meaningful statement is true or false, then you're committed to the idea of predestination. And I, that, the, the quality of the logic in that thought impresses me. Not that I believe in predestination, but just the quality of the logic. And to explain it, the idea is, if, if, here's a thought. You will have eggs for breakfast tomorrow. Now, if that thought is true, then you will have eggs for breakfast tomorrow, right? You're predestined to have eggs for breakfast if that thought is true. And so, for, for someone who's sensitive to logic and philosophy, that's kind of an interesting, that's, that's really a nice thought. Another one, which comes from mathematics, which isn't, it's really more of logic than mathematics. The idea is, suppose you want to add up all the numbers from 1 to 100. Of course, you could do it with a computer, 1 plus 2 plus 3. But there's a clever way to do it, where you don't need a computer. And supposedly an early mathematician did it. He was in whatever, second grade, and the teacher said, add up all the numbers from 1 to 100, probably to keep the class busy because they were misbehaving. And he raised his hand, and the teacher said, what? And he said, 5,050. Well, how did he do it? Well, I want you to imagine 100 people, 50 men and 50 women. The men have a number on their lapel, 1 to 50. And the women have a number on their dress or whatever, 51 to 100. And now we pair them off. The man with the number 1 is paired with the woman with the number 100. The man with the number 2 on his lapel suit is paired with the woman who has the number 99. The man with the number 50 is paired with the woman who has number 51. We have all of these adding up to 101, and we have 50 of them. 50 times 101 is 5,050. But the idea is the quality of thought there impresses me. And this is something I did learn rather early, and it impressed me tremendously. And some people might see these things and say, who cares, so what? People have different interests, they have different talents. The artist maybe was impressed by color at a very early age, just found it wonderful and deep and entrancing. I knew a man once who played keyboard, and he had perfect pitch, and he was... Sometimes he'd play along with the song on the radio, and not only he knew the key and the chords and all that, but what he played sounded good, as if they had added it to that track, to the song on the radio, it would have made the song a better song. But if you have a sensitivity to, lo a sensitivity to logic and thought, maybe you're naturally drawn to philosophy or mathematics. Now, low, uh, mathematics, some people see that as just a bunch of rules. But mathematics, especially higher mathematics, is all about logic. You have a theorem, and you prove it using established, uh, other established facts. And I think that's what I'm trying to do with this natural theology, because I think religion is mostly aimed towards emotion. Religion says things that we feel emotionally about, we're attracted to, or it, it talks, speaks to our emotions, I think, not to our intellect. And one time, uh, just to give one of many examples, I was at a funeral, and the priest mentioned the resurrection of the body. The idea is that when Jesus comes and the world ends, our bodies will be resurrected. And I thought, well, you see, as I understand it, the Jewish people in ancient times had the idea of the resurrection of the body. Uh, here I am, this is me. When I die, I go into the ground, and someday I'll be resurrected, and here I'll be back again. Now, the Greeks had the idea of the immaterial soul, as if the body was a prison and we were really the soul. And it seems like the church took both ideas. So when I'm in Catholic school, I'm taught that when you die, you go to heaven or hell. Of course, you could go to purgatory, but you end up in either heaven or hell. And so imagine St. Augustine died 1,600 years ago. Well, let's suppose he went to heaven. So he's been in heaven for 1,600 years, enjoying the perfect bliss of communion with God and all that. And let's suppose that Jesus comes tomorrow and the world ends, and an angel comes along to St. Augustine and says, here's part of your body, the rest will be along shortly. Is Augustine supposed to say, wow, I thought I was happy to pass 1,600 years, but now that I'm getting my body back, I am really happy. I think that the two ideas, the resurrection of the body and the immaterial soul, 
makes sense separately. But it seems to me like Christianity just took both of the ideas and just threw them into the pot. And together, to me, uh, they don't make much sense. They seem contradictory. So I think that what I'm trying to do is construct a philosophy, a theology, maybe even eventually a religion that is internally consistent, that has uh, pays attention to logic and, and, and tries to have ideas that fit together, that make sense, that form a whole. And uh, I guess that's all I have to say. That's what I'm trying to do. Thank you.